Welcome, Osama. Great Thank to you. have you here in Copenhagen. Very happy to be here. Uh, I already told people that uh, I invested in your in your firm a few years back because I think it's one of the leading organizations in the world in that field. But uh, maybe you want to put a few words on what does the family actually do? Sure. Uh, at the family, we have a very simple mission: trying to build a company like Google from Europe. Uh, we invest in 100 startup every year um, across London, Paris, and Berlin. Uh, and we try to help them on whatever it takes to succeed. Uh, we don't have a standard program like most incubators. Uh, we try to customize our approach. Uh, if we were a school, we'd be the Montessori of startup. <laughs> <laughs> we really try to take every startup for their need and to provide them an infrastructure uh, to help them grow and succeed. I remember when we first met, actually, uh, we, Saxo Bank had a product presentation in this beautiful place you have in the, in the middle of Paris, right? Uh, so, so you use a central location to call people, you still have that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so how, how does that work? What do you use that place so for? So this place is really about meeting together. Um, one of the things we wanted to break is that we don't want that startup have an office in our incubator. Uh, because I think building a startup is like building a religion and religion don't share space. Mm -hmm. uh, you will never see a temple with a, <laughs> with a church. Um, what is important for us is to have a place where people can gather. They can come, drink together, eat together, enjoy together, uh, and the other times they are in their own office focused to work. And I think this switch between the moment where you are super focused as an entrepreneur and the moment where you are in entertain mode are important. Mm -hmm. And the goal of the family <laughs> is to provide people this very cheerful environment where what is hard outside become easy at the family because everybody struggle in the same things. Uh, if you are in a house where everybody's crazy, being crazy looks super normal. Uh, <laughs> so that's what this place is about, is about gathering people together. So we organize workshop, we organize uh, education, conference, dinners, parties. Uh, we even had like two marriage in this uh, <laughs> in this office. So it's to tell you how much the family is a family. Well, I mean, you 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 mean that seriously? That that the title of the company, the family, yeah. right? I mean, you're really looking after people and, yeah. and having fun with them, but also also supporting them and helping yeah. them when they need I, it. I I think the name is perfect for what we do because the family pro what a good family pro procure to people education, um, safety, and capital. And that's exactly what we do. We educate entrepreneurs not only about how to be an entrepreneur, but also how to look like an entrepreneur. Uh, we provide an environment to protect them from the outside world because when you start as a startup, you're a bit fragile. So we need <coughs> a place that can provide you this protection and capital. And the funny thing is that most of the places that invest in startups start with the money. Mm. They first have the money discussion and then they try to add value. We try to really add value and then maybe if you deserve it, uh, like in a good family, we will give you a little bit of money. <laughs> so uh, what, what's your own background prior to this? So I, I, I have been a very average entrepreneur <laughs> before starting the family. Um, basically, I, I was born in Lebanon. Uh, I came in France uh, after the war. So kind of refugee story. Uh, um, one of the funny thing I always tell people is that it took me a long time to realize that we were poor because my family was rich in Lebanon. Uh, and when we came in Paris, we have lose everything. But mm -hmm. my mom was so energetic that w when I was like, why is the house is so small? Oh, because in France, houses are small. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I remember very well when I was 12, I changed school. I was I went from this very shitty school in the suburb to this central school, elite school, and all my friends had this amazing house. And I was like, Mom, are you sure about the house of friends? Because, <laughs> because there are so many people that have much better. And, and it pissed me off. Yeah. It pissed me off. So I, I started to find, wanted to find a way to make money. Uh, it was kind of an obsession with me. I was like, there is no way I stay poor. Like, that's not a plan. 
And so I started to sell websites when I was mm. 13. At 15, I sold my first web company uh, for a million dollars. Wow. Uh, at 15? At 15, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was wow. 1998. It was so easier. <laughs> 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 and if I was 18, I think I would have sold it for 100 million. <laughs> and, and, and so after that, I always been an entrepreneur. But the funny thing uh, that took me time to realize is that each time I created a company, I was very short-sighted because I had this money pressure. And it took me a long time to understand that if you want to build something significant, you need to be super long-term oriented. Uh, you need to take decisions that are not about quick wins, but about doing things. So I was super street smart, but it took me almost 15 years to, uh, wise. to, to, to be a bit wiser. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that's why the family is so successful is because I think we, we get entrepreneurs that understand the long term and we provide this kind of energy that you need at yeah. the beginning. And you need to always switch between. And for me, helping hundreds of projects is much more interesting than doing one because I always had this lack of focus. I think you cannot be massively focused, massively successful without a huge focus. And I find a way to trick myself. Being unfocused is my focus as a family. <laughs> And, and so I think that's why it works out so well. So that could lead to another question because what we really want to talk to you about is sort of the, the product market fit. That's a bit of a buzzword, but mm. everybody talks about that uh, today. And you, you brought many companies and many products to, to market or at mm. least played a role in that. Yeah. So, so what's your view on, 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 that whole, on that whole term? I mean, yeah. what, what does it mean when people <coughs> invest to say, do your, do your product market fit and, and then come back and we'll invest in you? I think, I think it's a super important concept because it helps you understand before and after product market fit. I think product market think is less interesting than what is after and what is before. Uh, most of the article and advice that are written on internet are very contradictory. Like you will read an article that say you should save money and not overspend. That's what good entrepreneur does. And then you have this VC that writes you need to burn capital to go fast and go. And I think it's confusing, but if you tell yourself that the first article is written for pre-product market fit, and the other one is post-product market fit, mm -hmm. then defining what is product market fit for you is important. Product market fit uh, is three things. First, it's obvious, it's personalized, and it's dynamic. Obvious, most of the time, before you leave a product market fit, you don't really know. Like if you have a doubt that you are in product market fit, it means you are not. It's, it's very easy. Product market fit most of the time means that the phone rings so much that you cannot serve your client. That, uh, that each time you do something, 10 things come back at you. Uh, if you have a, like a boxer image, it's like you punch uh, you know, like the, the bag of sand and the bag come back in your face 10 times. And you're like, why? What? I, I just did that and it came back at me. So I think <coughs> if there is not a number, an absolute number that define product market fit, but most of the time, if you have a discussion and debate about, okay, are we in product market fit or not, it means that you are not. Uh, it's a bit like porn. Uh, you, you know, there is a, like, <laughs> there is a long story uh, in, the, um, in the US judicial system about how to define porn. And we had like so many legal discussions. And one day one guy come up with this definition is that porn doesn't create debate. Everybody agree on what is porn. People can debate at what is hard, blah, blah, blah. And it's the same thing with product market fit. Some, some people think they have it because they lie to themselves and lying to yourself is the most dangerous thing you can do as an entrepreneur. That's why surrounding yourself with very honest people and brutally honest people is very important. But also it's about getting to this point where there is no discussion. Then starts the second problem with product market fit is that it's customized. <clears throat> the way you define your product market fit also defines the kind of company you want to build. Uh, I will give you a very simple example. Uh, we have a gaming company in the family. Uh, this gaming company is run by very ambitious people. And they want to build something like Angry Bird or, or like these massive games, uh, 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 titans of games like that. Um, their first game got downloaded for one million, um, uh, by one million users the first month. And, and then the second month, it got uh, downloaded by 500,000 and 200,000. I think a game with 2 million users, somehow, it's a game you can make a, a very nice living on. Uh, if you get 10% of your user paying for that, you can live on. But the problem 
is that they are much more ambitious than that. And mm. so they decided to kill the game and do <coughs> another game. And of course, that game is working much less than the previous oh. one. <laughs> and then they did a third game, a fourth game. And, and one day they did a game that was number one in, in the App Store. Um, that process is because the way you define your product market fit is also the way you define your own ambition. You have multiple ways to product market fit. Product market fit is about the market responding to you, but does the market is responding what you want to hear? Of course, he's saying back something. He's saying there is a market here, but is it really the market you want to go after? And the last thing is that product market fit is dynamic. One of the things entrepreneurs, especially young ones, forget is that markets change fast. Uh, if you were in Bitcoin uh, uh, two years ago, it was easy to be a genius. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it just go up. So what, whatever you do, you can do as many mistakes. Now, if you are still in Bitcoin, you need to be a really, really tough and really strong. We because used to, we used to say that about the traditional <coughs> markets. You yeah. know, to be a genius at market analysis, you just have to be in a bull market and not very much experience. Right? <laughs> then you're a genius. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Same thing. And, and, and the fact that the market fit is dynamic, it, it can mean it's something we see all the time, is that the company thinks we will grow like that, and actually we grow like that. And the problem is that they took investment and expense to grow like that. And that's where we have a big difference between Europe and the US, is that in the US, this kind of mistake can be corrected super fast. If you hire 150 people by mistake, you can fire them the week mm. after. Good luck in Europe. Mm. <laughs> Good luck to manage that. Most same places. Speed. Actually, Denmark yeah. has a quite a flexible market compared ah, to France true. or Germany. Okay. So that's uh, one advantage we do have yeah. here, that you don't have to be so scared of scaling up because that's it's cool. also possible to scale down. That's but, cool uh, to know. Yeah. But it's, it's one of the issues. Mm. And also the denial of facing that dynamism. And it works also the other way. Um, product market fit can kill companies. Startups are not hard because failed startups fail. Startups are hard because very successful startup die. And, and it's because of product market fit. Sometimes it's so strong that you are totally unable to, uh, to, to be at up to the market and then the market just rip you off because someone else come or competition understands the need you created and all of that is very dynamic. So it's about being in movement. Product market fit is really about understanding what are the market reality and how you can react to that and be extremely agile. But do you, do you think that's getting worse and worse, however you want to look at it? But I mean, I remember when I'm a little bit older than you and yep. things didn't change that fast back in the 80s yep. or, or the 90s, right? But that's now true. everything changes it's, every three months, right? It, it, it's becoming harder and harder to make money. Huh? Uh, I, even if I'm working since 10 years only in this industry, I feel it. I feel like so it's harder to find the good investments now than before. Or? I, I I think works both way. Um, <coughs> it's like it's easier to launch. It's mm. harder to scale. Uh, and I think before it was the opposite. Mm. I think before the price of starting something was crazy, yeah, yeah. but the, but when you have started and reached something, scaling was more comfortable. And you only had three yeah. competitors and yeah. not 300 like today. Yeah. yeah. And, and sometimes, um, I can give you an example. We lived last week in the family. Uh, one of our company uh, is going after the uh, temp market in France, working temporary uh, in inter interim in French. Uh, I don't know if you have that in Denmark. Is when, sure. Yeah, OK. And, and they build the software that make all the process of being able to hire a temp worker so easier. And they think that that was a huge advantage. And I think they seriously made a lot of breakthrough in this process, talking with the government, convincing them to do an API, um, building this API to be smooth, blah, blah, blah. But last week, their biggest competitor, and that is big company, announced that they implemented the same API. And of course, we have this right. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a free market. Like the government is not doing something for one company. And then you realize that as a startup, you just open the doors. Yeah. You know, like you... Uh, another very good example of that was each. It's a competitor of Uber. And at one point, we realized that uh, the model each was building in Paris of having people that are not professional driver being able to go. And they lobby for that, went to, to justice, blah, blah, blah. Each realized that if they win, 
it's make Uber winning. Yeah, 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 Be yeah. Because they are just opening the door yeah. and the system, and the other one can just wait. Yeah, and then Uber and, is ready yeah. to lose 100 million euros a year for a little while. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so this dynamism of the product market field is interesting. And that's why also I think being an entrepreneur is more and more like being a very high level sport people. It's much more about your personal discipline than your understanding of the business. It's like if you look now, what makes an incredible entrepreneur, you need to be an incredible manager, you need to have a committed team, you need to be able to articulate a mission. Uh, it's a lot of things that have nothing to do with your actual expertise in business. Uh, if you have people that are better than you in mm. the business, it's good. But it's really about being this maestro that is able to get people doing magic. And, it, and that's not easy. Uh, and well, what I think does it take to get to that? I mean, presumably, when you straight out of business school or even not going to business school, must yeah. take some experience to get to that point. Is that the first or the fifth startup you that, succeed? That's the or? point. The mm. point is that uh, people now don't do MBA; they do failed startups with angel <laughs> money. <laughs> 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 and I think if you're an angel investor, you need to understand that and just yeah. repeat your bet. It's becoming more and more long term. So obviously, the family is an investor. Yeah, I'm an investor in the family. Yeah. Are you doing some good, uh, some good investments? Are there something you're proud of, excited about, something that worked out well? Yeah, yeah. W what is the most amazing in the family is that because we focus on people and not so much on business, uh, we have been able to build very contrarian product market fit. If you look at our top 10 startups, they will have been impossible to imagine. So let me give you a few examples. Um, we have a company that do a payroll management software. Payroll management software is the most boring industry yeah, you can really imagine. Exciting. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But they are excited by yeah. that. The funny thing is that we met this team 23, 23 <coughs> years old at that time, and they were really excited about getting this problem done. And what is funny about their way of doing this problem is that they did not only manage to do a payroll software, they built their own programming language to be able to express the complexity of payroll in France in one single software. And so now, each time the government change a law, and they love to change law, mm. Payfit is always the first company uh, to be able to switch okay. and update the software. They grew from zero to one million a month in revenue in less than 24 months. Like that's amazing product market fit. Yeah. And they, they have been able to serve the client because their technology was superior. So that's a perfect fit between the team and the market. And the market was really unobvious because everybody was like, yeah, I have a payroll system, it works. Why I want something better? A US example of that is not at the family, but everybody's talking about it right now, is Zoom. Mm. Zoom S1 that just get filled for the IPO last week. is so amazing because Zoom is just a video conferencing software, like mm. there is thousands of them, but it's just executed better. And it shows how much product market fit can be ripped off from others. Because Cisco proved the need for that. Uh, they have WebEx, blah, blah, blah. But Zoom just came in a small niche and built a better product very patiently. And now it's one of the very few profitable tech company. Mm. You know, I, I don't know what surprises most of the people is that Zoom succeed or that it's profitable, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like there's a mistake somewhere. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a but problem. It's funny because I also often get invited to Zoom or use Zoom, but, but yeah. I mean, to me, I never thought much about it. It's just something you use. Yeah. But what is, it that, what is it that they did better than whoever else is doing this? Hundreds of small details. Yeah. And that's, I think that's what we need to tell entrepreneurs. We need to tell entrepreneurs is that if from the outside it's obvious why you succeed, in a time of internet, mm. it makes your life very complicated. Yeah. It's like now we are much more in the time of magician. We call it the time of magician. Is that a good magic trick, it's a trick you don't understand. And when you face a magic trick, you are always like, my God, I, you know, you try to look and be like, focus on every step and something happened, you don't see it. And, and that produced you a joy. I think good startups now are magic tricks. Uh, Zoom is a magic trick. Like if you try to find one reason Zoom works better than the others, you cannot define it. So only people that can define it are people inside Zoom because they have such an insider knowledge of the market. They know so much small details that they are able to product a classic, like a customized product market fit and just follow 
a pocket of market after pocket of market. And, and, and I think that's what is very interesting. And, 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 and what Same looks people. like a relatively simple product on, on, on the surface. You yeah. say they're IPOing, what's it worth? Uh, I, I, I don't want to say a mistake, but I think it's 9 billion or 8 billion. Yeah. It's nice for a piece of yeah. uh, video conferencing. Yeah. <laughs> and it's massively yeah. profitable. Of course, we all like to tell about our success stories, uh, mm. myself including, but uh, at least I know I have had many failures, also many investments that didn't mm. turn out the way uh, I wanted, and a few that turned out better than I expected. But yeah. what about the, uh, your sort of success rate? I mean, obviously, you must have also uh, not so, many failures. So 100 startups a year, mm. 50 of them will raise the first round, 25 of them will raise the second round, and one will become an iconic company. Mm -hmm. That's our historical rate year over year. <coughs> and the funny thing, I don't know, like... So 50 fall by the yeah. wayside, they're gone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then the 50 makes like an angel investment yeah. or a seed investment. Yeah, yeah. 25 raise a Serie A, mm -hmm. and something like five of them will become really good company, and mm -hmm. one will become iconic. So it shows how hard yeah. it is. If it's one in a hundred that pays all the bills, you can get a little bit worried when you only have 30. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, so the 50 that fall by the wayside, well, what is that? Bad execution, bad idea? So there is five level of failure. Uh, level number one is co-founder drama. Uh, okay. We don't imagine how many so people, oh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and the funny thing is that I think that doesn't happen a lot at the family because we filter a lot about that. You know, that's uh, something actually in earlier programs that yeah. I discussed a couple of times because some of the people that ask for money in yeah. this program, they don't have a clear definition of roles. You don't know yeah. who's the boss, who's not the boss. Is that yeah. what you're talking about? That leads yeah, to we, drama? Yeah, we are so hardcore on that. For example, yeah. when someone joins the family, we always like to ask very early on, okay, who is the CEO? Mm, okay, exactly. so if this guy take a decision you don't agree, are you going to just follow him or not? And if people are not crystal clear, in 20 seconds, that's a no-go for me. Like, you have no time, like, good startup are very good dictatorship. Mm. You have no time for democracy in startup. You're not rich enough. I think being a democracy is, like, you need to be a really well-developed <laughs> country before being a democracy. Um, and so you don't have that time in startups. Then stage number two is there is so many entrepreneurs that try to do something for themselves not considering that the client is any part of the conversation. So they, they don't know how to seduce customer. They, don't, they are not trying any effort. Mm. You know, they come to the first date and they pretend that you need to adopt them the way they are. And that <laughs> if you are not happy, that's, that's fine for you. But the problem is that it's a seduction game. So you need to put your best uh, jacket and you need to buy flowers and you need to, and especially with first client because mm. You don't really know where the truth is, so you need to, to put an extra effort. Then start uh, the product market fit. So that's pre-product market fit failure. Then you have product market fit or not. So a lack of product market fit is a good reason to die. And then you have, I was hardest failure. Like one of them is called Save. Uh, it's a company that grew to zero to 24 million in revenue a year in 18 months and he ended up miserably sold for $1. Wow. Uh, and, and because the management team was totally unable to manage the growth, and we were totally unable to give the right advice, so it's kind of sheer messed up. And it was one of the first company. I, I will tell you this story that really traumatized me. They were doing so many sales a day that the banking system broke up. Mm. And the banking software was unable to process and so they stayed 60 days out of their bank account with the bank not knowing how to manage that because they have a software for small companies, a software for big companies, but they never had the case of a small company becoming that fast or big, and they didn't know how to transfer the data from one software wow. to another. Crazy. And, and, and so imagine that multiple, by like they hired 600 people in 12 months, and I think half of them were crazy because you start to attract really nuts people because they are like, okay, that's party. And if you are not fat enough at that stage, any mistake can kill you. And what happened in this company is that <coughs> the company started to get late numbers to the investors because they were late on accounting, late on everything, and the numbers did not make sense. 
And the fact that they did not make sense, and they did not make sense because everything was so crazy, so fast, blah, blah, blah. And, and it was a time where the investor will have need to calm down and everybody sit. But to do that, you need trust. And because the founders were young and the investor and them had like only six months of relationship, mm -hmm. everybody started to yell at each other. I remember being in board meetings at 2 a.m. With, with people just throwing stuff at <laughs> each other. And, and, and the company ended up uh, dying. And, 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 and the funny thing is that the people that bought this company did a very good business out of it. So it, it, it shows how much uh, management can kill. And, sure. the, and the last reason mm -hmm. to be dead is external reason. Uh, the best story we have at the family that it's, it's a moment if you put it in a movie, you will say the screenwriter is completely nuts. Uh, we were at a closing dinner of one of our startup and everybody was drunk. The investor was drunk, the entrepreneur was drunk, and the, the entrepreneur at 2 a.m., I don't know why he did that, he opened his reporting system, and he was like, this is strange, I have zero visit on the website. And he was like, yeah, that's strange. And then he started to text his technical people calling them, and everybody was, nobody was noticing him because everybody was drunk. And at one moment, the guy was like white, 2 a.m. in a restaurant, and he said, guys, I need to tell you something. Google delisted us. We got, ex we got expulsed out of Google. We don't have any traffic anymore. And the guy was like celebrating a 8 million oh round. And you have to imagine this table of investor where everybody go down <laughs> like, <laughs> and, really uh, and, and one of the investors that was drunk think that he was whispering to a, to a junior but he was actually shouting super loud. He said, can we get the wire back? <laughs> 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 and so external, like it's, it's like you are in a Greek tragedy and God Google. That's and truly a black swan. Yeah, that, I had uh, a black swan. Yeah. And the funny thing is that they met someone very senior at Google. Like they basically <laughs> went to Google. They wanted to understand what happened to them. Mm. And they finally got a meeting with a very senior people at Google that was looking at computer was like, like, I'm sorry guys, we don't even know you. Like we changed the algorithm and it had this impact on you, but it's in AI, so we cannot explain to you what happened. Wow. That's and so it's not like you, so someone took a decision. Of Google as well. Right? Yeah, because it's, a, it's, a, it's a new world. Greek god. So if you turn it around, so that's the reasons you get failed. And so if you don't want to do that, you need to have a clear definition of roles. You yep. need to have uh, be able to manage growth, which is important yep. because sometimes people say, "Oh, a lot of stuff happening," but that's a positive problem. We'll solve yep. it, but you don't actually always solve it, right? No, and, and it's not so positive. Yep. Of course, you can get hit by the by the black swan, so yep. at least you should try to make it a white swan, so you know yep. it could be coming. And what was the fourth one? I forget. Um, and uh, only so team, um, uh, product market fit. Oh yeah. Sure. Uh, and sure. an ability to manage it, yeah. growth and yeah. external events. Yeah. So, I know that uh, you, you obviously you came out of Paris. You uh, you then have some activity in London. You have yeah. some activity in Berlin. Yeah. But I think I've also seen you here in Copenhagen a couple of times. Yeah, right? yeah. So we, what's going we, on? We, we, we enjoy so much the restaurant. We need an excuse to come <laughs> to come more often, especially in yours. Um, no. Um, so. The family since day one is pan-European as a project. Uh, um, I, I have a very clear view of how I see the world. For me, China is becoming dystopian. I'm, I, I know it since 15 years. Uh, I know that the US will be less and less a welcoming land. Uh, my name is Usama. I lived in the US. I, I know what it is to stay eight hours each time you take the plane to the US in a room mm -hmm. where they ask you if you like Pakistan or not. Really? Uh, yeah. It's, it's so. So I, I I felt as a citizen that Europe has a card to play in this game of what is the future. I think anyone that pretend what is the future is a liar because nobody knows the future. Sure. What you can do is to build it. Like you, like the future is not a passive game. It's a very active game. There is few people in the world that at some point say, okay, I'm going to play at that game called let's build the future. It can be in a very narrow way can be in a very large way. Uh, and I don't think politicians are the people that are really playing that game. It's more about product, entrepreneur technologies, and things like that. So you're actually quite positive on Europe vis-a-vis -vis yeah. vis -vis, uh, Yeah, and China I think, and, and so that's the point. The point is that there is this silly competition to know if London, Paris, or Berlin will be the next Silicon Valley. 
and this competition doesn't make sense. If Europe is able to build giant, it will mean that this giant will be very distributed and someone will need to own a way to let the best one, wherever they come from in Europe, to access the best resource wherever they are. So coming to Copenhagen, going to Madrid, Lisbon, Bucharest is a very natural plan for us. The question is how we do that. Because we cannot just replicate what we did in Paris. We mm. built the family in Paris <coughs> that was really based on the toxicity of Paris and how to take this toxicity out and build a safe land. We did the same in London. It I remember you, when we first spoke, you talk, talked a lot about this being toxic, yeah. like this very bad environment for... for yeah. Is that still your view in, in Paris? Or? I think we build a safe land that is not yeah, you toxic. Have, but but around I think, you, yeah. when you leave the family, then you're yeah, in trouble. I think, uh, I, think, <laughs> I think yes. And for a simple reason is mm. that nobody really built massive company yet. There is some billion dollar success, but not yet 100 billion. And what we tell everyone is that there is no reason we don't build 100 billion company at the family. There's no reason. Maybe it will take 20 years, 30 years, that's fine. But there is no reason that Africa do it, Asia do it, US do it, and Europe don't. Mm. Like that's, that's, that's something we should, as Europeans, be shamed about. And, and so I'm spending a lot of time in Copenhagen for three reasons. First, in the Nordics, it's the most Mediterranean country. Uh, and, and that's how we feel it. <laughs> and so we feel close uh, to Copenhagen. The second thing is that the pool of talent is amazing. And the third thing is that people here build really good startups in the past. Uh, you're an example of that. Uh, Lego is, a, is an example of that. Carlsberg is another example. So something happened here. So why it will not happen in tech new generation? And, and so that's why we explore a lot uh, this ecosystem. So, so if, if some Danish entrepreneur is sitting there saying, I, I need exactly that kind of help and, yeah. and a more well, pan-European yeah. view, how, how, how do they reach out to you? So just go on them? the website, click on apply. Uh, we are able now to treat startup completely virtually. Uh, Paris, London and Berlin are not offices where people need to come all the time. They are just resources to use wherever you are. So if you are in Copenhagen, you can access the best investor in London through us. You can access the best engineer product design knowledge from Paris. And you can access the best internationalization discipline, KPI knowledge from Berlin. So basically, we take the best caricature of each city, money, swag, mm -hmm. discipline. Mm -hmm. And we are able now to spread it all around. So we can accept startup from anywhere. So just, just come and we reply super fast. Do you have any people you're working with in Denmark? We have three startups in oh. Denmark now. Mm -hmm. uh, our favorite one is called The Greed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yeah, so it's, it's a small and humble beginning, but it's a beginning. Absolutely. As we're coming to a close here, if you were to give like three top generic ideas to a startup to actually get out there with something that, that would work, what, 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 mm -hmm. what should they start out with? Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's come down to, to our motto at the family. We, we have this motto, we say dare, care, share. So you, you need to dare. Uh, you cannot build something contrarian if you don't dare. You need to be courageous, you don't need to be shy. And even if you do something stupid, it's so cool to do it when you are poor. Because nobody, <laughs> nobody cares. And so like, that's very important. The second thing is that you need to care for the details. Uh, caring is, is liking. Uh, um, good entrepreneurs, they know their company inside out from the people to the operation. Like if you are this big thinker that thinks that just need an idea and then it will be done, uh, forget entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is an heart. It's, it's, about, it's like doing very high level cooking. It's not like you cannot be a very, you cannot be a great uh, chef if you are not a great cook. I never met a great chef that is not a great cook. Like, it will be very surprising. Like, yeah, I, I'm one of the best chefs, but I don't know how to do an egg. Please do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that will be very weird. And the last one is sharing. I think in one of the mistakes we all do in Europe is that we don't share enough. Uh, I, will, I will give you a story. Uh, when we started to go international, we struggled a lot at the family. I talk about that with you multiple times. Uh, it, it was a moment, you know, where it created tension in your team. Me and my co-founder, so basically what I was telling my co-founder is that if the family will be of only French company, I'm leaving. Like, I did not sign for that. I love France, I grew up in France, but I don't feel French. I feel much more European. I'm much happier to live in capitalist London 
<laughs> and the socialist friends, um, and, and I want to do something pan-European. But each time we were trying to expand, it was really hard for us. And then I met Paul Graham that created Y Combinator, basically mm -hmm. the family of the US, much more successful. Um, and I, m I literally meet him in the street, randomly in Paris. And I stop him and say, sorry man, are you Paul Graham? And the guy was like, yeah, how do you know me? I was like, okay, I know you, blah, blah. And he said, how, is, how things are going at the family? And at that moment, you have two choices. Choice number one, you can bullshit. You can be like, yeah, things are marvelous, I'm so good. Or you can be like, ah, look, I have this problem and this problem, can you help out? And, and of course I did that. And I said, look, it's going well in France, horribly at international, and I don't know why. And I said, okay, let's sit. And we sit together for two hours, and he found me the solution. He said, what you are trying to do is to replicate what you did in Paris. Think about international like day one. Imagine you created internationally day one, how it will look like. And so we fired half of the people in our team in Paris. We rebuilt all our process. It was really an horrible thing. And then international went wow. like that. Wow. And, great, and, and, and I think sharing <coughs> is not only about sharing your success, it's about genuinely intense with people. Everyone is an opportunity to learn something. And I think if you apply this dare, care, share all the time with your startups, things go out well. Because even if you have external factors, even if you don't have the right product market fit, blah, blah, the world will work for you. And I think being an entrepreneur is not about being the best, it's about having all the best wanting to circle for you, wanting that you succeed for some magical reason. Osama, thank you. Very inspiring. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for coming here Pleasure. to Copenhagen to tell us about the family and about Pleasure. your ideas. So yeah. next time we do it in Danish, huh? <laughs> <laughs>